Hey guys, today I want to show you a project that I've been working on for the last few days. It's a smart assistant called Pico that uses GPT-4 to chat and interact with the world through some APIs. So first I'll give you a demo of the things it can do, and then I'll walk through how it works, including how some of the functions work. Hello? How can I help you today? If you have any questions or need assistance, feel free to ask. So the voice is coming through the 11 Labs API, and we can turn it off or leave it on. With it on, it takes a little bit longer, but we can ask it to play music. have it adjust the volume. So it can control Spotify. Um, it can also send emails and SMS, so I'll show you that. Um, So I have a um, contacts um, CSV that I mocked up, and we can check. This is the email that it's set to. All right, there you go. So it sent, uh, generated a title and says, Hi John, just want to let you know I'm running three hours late to dinner. Apologies for any inconvenience this may cause. Looking forward to seeing you later. Great. It can also send a text, so we can say, There we go. Yeah, so that's a few of the features that it has. There's a few other features that I haven't integrated yet, and I'll run through some of them. So before I get to how each of the individual functions work, this is just an overview of what happens. As a user, we input some prompt, like tell John I'm gonna be running late for dinner, and then that gets sent to a Python function that just looks at a few keywords to decide if we need to chat or if we need an API. So it's looking for words like email, SMS, whatever. And if it says, doesn't find any keyword, then it sends that prompt to a GP24 chat agent, and then that agent responds with a chat response. If it does detect one of the keywords, then it sends it to this executive agent whose job is to decide which API to use. So if it's a false alarm, it sends it back to the chat agent. And if it says we do need an API, then it will reply, it'll call one of the other agents that we have, whether it's an email agent or SMS agent, and it'll use that to send the, uh, the API call. So this um, architecture of using agents, I think is really powerful. Um, instead of trying to build one chatbot that can do all these things, we basically have a bunch of little sub agents that are specific for carrying out one task, and we can link them together so that we can um, do different tasks very easily rather than trying to cram everything into one block. So these are all the files that are in this project. It is a GitHub project, and I'll put the uh, link to the GitHub in the description so you can mess around with it and fork it if you want. The main one is Pico. Okay, so this is the code for pico.py, which is where we have the main chatbot and the user interface. And I'll walk through this one first, and then we'll get into some of the uh, API modules. So first thing we're doing is importing the OpenAI um, 
library and time. This is for using all the GPT agents. And then these imports here are for all those agents that I've created separately. So I don't just jam everything into one big thing. We have a text file that contains the key so that you guys can't see it. Um, and it's easy to change it quickly. So we get the API key. And then I have this chat class, which is the main chatbot class. So if you're not familiar with classes and object-oriented programming, I'm not going to go through all the details. But basically, this function in it starts. So we have a speech equals true. So this obviously controls whether it's going to be using the 11 labs text to speech API or not. So when we instantiate an object of the chat class, it'll always do these things. It'll get the model that we specify, like GPT-4, and it'll set these um, variables, like whether or not speech is true. And then this is a basic chat response. So we use these chat completions from OpenAI, where we tell it which model to use. That's what we fed it in the beginning. The temperature, I'll get a little to that later. OK, so a little bit about temperature in the context of large language models. Temperature is a hyperparameter, and it affects the frequency with which a certain token is returned. So I have this demo from Luke Salamone, which will help demonstrate it. So for an example, you might have a prompt, or you might have a uh, sentence, what did the mouse eat? And the large language model is trying to predict the next word. So the temperature will affect the chance that it picks a given word. So the large language model, in general, will generate a list of possible completions for the next word. And in this example, it could be cat, cheese, pizza, cookie, etc. Now, one is going to be most likely cheese. But as we increase the temperature, we kind of increase the noise, and we increase the chance that any given answer that it thinks is likely gets picked. So this means when the temperature is extremely low or zero, then the model is deterministic. It will always pick the most likely answer every single time. And as we increase the temperature, then the chance that we pick the second best or the third best or the fourth best answer increases. And when the temperature gets really high, it kind of just picks anything at random. So why would we want the temperature to be anything other than zero? Well, when we're having a conversation like with a chatbot, we don't want the conversation to play out identically every time. Um, so if we say hello and the temperature is set at zero, then the large language model will always return the same output. And if we increase the temperature a little bit more, then we might get some different answers. And then even when we prompt the model with the same prompt, we have a chance of getting slightly different answers. So that's how temperature works in the context of large language models. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, of course. But when we're using large language models in our project, like in the Pico, the Smart Assistant project, um, I usually set the temperature above zero, like at 0 0.7, for the chat models. And that gives kind of um, some creativity and a little bit of randomness to the kinds of answers it can generate. But then when we're doing something like having an agent that's always going to um, call Spotify or send an email in a certain way, then we reduce the temperature because we want to get rid of some of that noise and just have a very consistent regular output. So this chat method will respond with a whole reply where you'll type in something and then you'll have to wait until it's finished the reply and then you'll get the reply back. This stream chat one is a function that I made a little bit later that generates the uh, response as it goes. So we get the model, we get the temperature, I'll explain that. We have our messages and we're streaming it. And we instantiate a variable called reply content and one called chunk as empty strings. And this whole bit of text basically gets the uh, response as it's being generated and keeps printing it with the additional new stuff that happens. That way we can 
kind of print it as it's being generated and still wait instead of waiting until it's all done. And then what we do here is we look for punctuation marks, so exclamation, question mark, or period. And if we said to do text to speech, then we'll start generating that um, text into speech once we reach the end of a sentence. That way we don't try and call it as each token is generated. We just generate one full sentence, translate that text into speech, and then return that, and then move on to the next sentence. So this is the simple Python function I was showing you um, that checks for keywords to see if we need to call the executive agent. So it's just looking to see if the prompt contains keywords like play or volume or next song or send an email or email. Um, and if it is, then uh, it'll, ref it'll return true. And if not, it'll return false. So it's simple Boolean response looking for some keywords. Then this next class is the executive agent. It works pretty similarly to the chat agent, but it's conditioned to be a little bit different. So similarly, we instantiate it with some model like GPT-4, and then we have a function called identify task. So this is a dictionary, and we have the response here, say send email, and then here we have some key to that dictionary. So Basically, we'll use this later. If we get the response send email, then we'll call the send email function. If we get analyze documents, then we'll call the document agent. So we complete, we make this new chat completion model, and we set the temperature to zero, which makes it deterministic. Then we have these messages, and we specify a system message. The system message tells the agent or the GPT-4 model, how it's supposed to behave. So the default for ChatGPT is you are a helpful assistant, but you could say you are a talking cat, or you're a person named Bob who really likes dogs. It doesn't matter, but here we're telling it how we want it to behave, and I say you analyze user input and output the names of functions to fulfill a user's needs. The Spotify agent can search for music or artists, play and pause songs, or go to the next song. You can output send email, Spotify agent, send SMS, analyze documents to fulfill a request, otherwise reply chat. And then we inject the prompt. So, and then we get the reply out. So the reply should be something from this list, and we've told it what it can do with the Spotify agent. and it's smart enough to figure out what send SMS and send email can do. Um, so if send email, Spotify agent, or SMS is in the reply, then we look to the dictionary that we specified here, and then we call that agent. So that's what this is doing. Spotify agent will call, so if the output contains the phrase Spotify agent, then we actually call the Spotify agent with that prompt um, and return whatever the Spotify agent returns. Otherwise we say false and if it's false then we'll default to the chat agent. And then this here is the user interface. So obviously it says welcome to the interface, um, type quit, and then we have our system our message history. So that's where we're going to store the history of the user interacting with the chatbot. Like I said before, the system message tells the model how to behave. So in this case, we say, you are Pico. Pico is an AI assistant. Your name is Pico. You can chat, send emails, and interact with Spotify. And then we add that system message to our message history. So it's the first thing in there. And then the max history is... Um, the limit of the number of messages that can be considered. Because each time we're making a request, we're sending like the system message and the previous messages to give context. But if we make that max message history really large, then we're going to be consuming a lot of tokens and we have to pay for each token. So while true, this is just a, a, a while loop that'll just keep going um, until someone types quit. And here we're just adding what the user inputs, 
to the user message history and this part just checks the max history and we always want the system message to be in our message history even if we're only considering like the last three or four responses so this bit of code here just inserts the system message when we start getting past our max history length and then we check if the executive is needed by calling that is exec needed function on the input so here we're doing that thing where we check for the keywords and then if it's true then we call the executive and then we get the response from whichever agent the executive has called if it's false which means if the executive says we actually don't need one of those API agents then we just use the chat agent and if the executive isn't needed the same thing we just get the chat agent back and this part if main, if name equals main just um, calls this function that's the core of how this works that's the chat class the executive agent and the user interface so now I'll go into how some of these other libraries like the send email the Spotify agent and the SMS agent work okay so this is the 11 labs text-to-speech library that I wrote it's just a very simple implementation of the 11 labs API so again we have our keys and we have our basic function which takes in the text and some parameters so the stability and similarity boost are related to how the speech model replies like stability means it's going to jump around all over the place in terms of its intonation um, so I found that these values work just fine uh, the URL is which model we're requesting so this particular model is the voice that you heard um, I forget what it's called and then we submit this uh, request um, in this format that the API uses where we have our key and content type and we submit this uh, data block which includes our text and the values that we defined before the stability and the similarity boost and then we get some response and process it with this uh, JSON library and we return the response content which is a mp3 file I believe and then we have the second helper function called play audio content which can just play some audio using um, the IO library so that's pretty straightforward okay so this is the email interface and I'm not going to get too into the weeds of how interacting with the Gmail API actually works in part because I'm not that fluent in it but I'll go over the basics so we have a function called load contacts which takes in a file name and this is opening a CSV file and storing it in this variable called reader and then it's looking for the rows by name so it searches for one called name and one called email value one dash value which is um, the title of that uh, column that's generated by my Google contacts and then it returns that contact this will give us the name and then the email uh, from all of our contacts okay and this is what that contact CSV looks like so we have a name given name um, family name and then all these different things like birthday gender whatever and we have one for email called email value one and we have one for the phone number called phone one value so this template I just got by downloading my Google contacts um, CSV file and I just deleted everything and put in this one dummy but you can use your real contacts or add more so once we load the contacts we have this function called find best matching contact which does some sequence matching so that if what we specify doesn't match perfectly like if I say find John but the contact is under John Smith then it might not find it but what we do here is basically uh, we take the name that we're searching for and the contacts which we got from the load contacts function and we instantiate a similarity variable at zero and then we look through that whole list matching the name after we get rid of all the capital letters 
and compare it to all the contact names, also after we get rid of the capital letters, and we check the similarity with this uh, sequence matcher function that we got from uh, diffLib. And then we return the best match. If we found something with a similarity greater than 0 0.5, and we can obviously adjust this, otherwise we say none. So no, nothing found. This function here, send email, another GPT-4 agent. This one's system role is you identify the recipient, title, and body of an email to be sent based on a user's request. The output must be in the format recipient, pipe, email type, title, pipe, and then email body. So by putting in these pipes, we can split along those. Um, in some of the other ones, I used a list instead of pipes, so maybe I should get around to changing this to be consistent, but for now it works. And then we inject the prompt. So the system knows that's what it's supposed to do. Then we give it a prompt, which could be send John an email telling him I'm going to be late for dinner. And then it's going to try and output something in that format that we specified. So again, the reply content is what the model returns. And then the email data is that content after we split on the pipe, because we know that our reply should have pipes in it. And then the first one should be the who we're sending it to. The second one should be the subject of the email, and the last part should be the body. So we get that out of the email data variable. And then we strip all of them. That gets rid of any white space, um, spaces at the beginning or the end. Here we're checking, is the at sign in the contacts? So if I type in someone's email, like john at gmail.com, then we don't need to go looking through our contacts. We can just send it directly to that address. But if there is no at sign, then we know we have to look up our contact. So we load contacts and find the best matching contact, which are those functions that I just showed you. And um, if we find something, then we set the to to the context best match, which is basically looking up that email value of the person that we found that best matches the prompt. Otherwise, we say we couldn't find it. This part I'm not going to walk through. Essentially, it just takes that information that we got here, the to, the subject, and the body, and uses the Gmail API to send an email. So it has to convert it into the right forms, it has to get the credentials. Again, nothing too interesting here. So that's how the email interface works. Pretty straightforward. I mean, we're sending an email in less than 100 lines of code, 81 lines. So not so bad. Let's take a look at another API. OK, so this is the Spotify interface. So as you can see here, we're doing the same thing, getting our open AI API keys from that text file. But we also need Spotify keys, because we're going to be using the Spotify API, and we need to be connected to our Spotify account. So there's several different uh, things in that, in that text file, the client ID, the client secret, and there's also a path to the executable file, so we know how to open it, and the device ID. So that's this computer's device ID, so that we know where to send the music. So we have a few functions that are these helper functions, like is Spotify running, which just uses this uh, PSUtil to check if there's something called Spotify that's currently running, and if so, we return true, and if not, we say false. So that's pretty simple. We need that to tell, should we open Spotify, or is it already open? We have this open Spotify windows, which checks the is Spotify running function. And if not, then it gets the path to our Spotify executable, which remember is in our Spotify's key text file. And it uses the OS library to start the thing at that path, which is our executable. And then we sleep for one second to just let it load, which may or may not be necessary. My computer's pretty fast. It can usually boot Spotify in less than one second. And then we define a bunch of helper functions, like uh, play song, play item, um, and control playback. So I'll walk through some of these, but I'm not sure we need to go into a whole bunch of detail. Um, so we have our search query, 
and search type track. So this, this one will just play a song. It turns out that playing a song and playing an artist or a playlist is slightly different, so we have to create different functions to handle each of the different cases. So we um, start the Spotify API client with our client ID and the secret and um, a local URL. And this is um, these are things that we get from that uh, keys text file. And then we're going to search with our query and we're going to say limit one, so get the top result. Um, if there's nothing found, then we say nothing found. Otherwise, we get the item URI, which is the unique resource identifier. So that's kind of like um, the ID tag for a song. And then we have to check if we can play on something. So we play it by transferring the playback to the current device. If the search type is track, then we'll play it on that device using this command, and if it's an artist, we'll play it with these commands. This is just specific to the Spotify API and how it manages playing different types of media. So we have this control playback function that can pause um, or adjust the volume or go to the next song, and it takes in an action. Again, we just set up the Spotify client just like before, and if the input is volume, and there is some number between 0 and 100, then we set the volume to that value. Same thing with pause, we just use the Spotify API, the Spotify API to um, use its method, whether that's pause playback or next track or start playback. That's how we define all the helper functions, and then just like before, we use those helper functions in our GPT-4 agent to actually control those things. So, Again, we have um, this system message, which explains that you control a music app based on user's request, you reply with a song name or artist to be played, or an action to be taken. And then we go on to describe if the user wants to resume, then you can say resume. If the user wants to play, then say pause. And if they're searching for a particular song or artist, then you'll respond in this format, or just the artist format. And then we get the reply again, if there's a pipe in the reply, then we know that it was asking for volume, because that's the only output that should have a pipe. And then we split it and set the, uh, and extract the volume number and send it to the control playback with volume as the action and the volume level, which is the number that we got. And then if it's pause, then we do exactly what you would think. We call that helper function. And if there is a hyphen in the reply, that means that it thought we were searching for a song and an artist. In that case, we'll use the play song function. Otherwise, we just got an artist or something else, and we'll use the play item function with the search type artist. So that's how the Spotify interface works. You're kind of seeing a pattern here. We just use the API to make a bunch of helper functions, and then we make a GPT-4 chat completion with some very specific system message that knows how to interact with those. And that saves us a lot of effort because it can translate natural language into very reliable commands like executing uh, a function, like is Spotify running or returning the volume. I'll go over the SMS interface very briefly. It's actually very similar to the email interface. Um, in this case, I'm using the Twilio API. And similarly, we have a Twilio's key that has our secret and our token and all that kind of stuff. And these are basically the same exact functions that we used in the email interface. The only difference being now, instead of looking for the email column, we're looking at the phone number column. Okay, so this is the SMS interface. It's actually very similar to the email interface, but we're using the Twilio API. So I'll go over it very briefly, but like I said, it's quite similar to the email one. We have a Twilio keys text that has our SID and our authorization token and our Twilio number. And then this load contacts and find best matching contacts are basically identical to the functions that we had in the email interface. 
The only difference being that here we're looking for the column called phone one value as opposed to the email one value. And we have this helper function that sends an SMS. The Twilio API is much simpler for sending something than the uh, Google API. So we just get who we're sending it to and the body. And again, we have our SMS agent here. And the system message for this one says, you identify the recipient content of an SMS to be sent based on a user request. The output must be in the format recipient pipe SMS text. And again, we just split that on the pipe and we get the SMS data, which contains the uh, person to be sent to and the body of the text. We strip the white space and then we check um, if there are digits here. So this is similar to checking if there's the at sign, we're checking, did you just input someone's phone number like 1-800-444, whatever. Um, if not, then we'll use the best match and contacts thing. And then we just send the SMS with whatever we get. So like I said, pretty straightforward, pretty similar to the email interface. Um, but there's a couple that are different, and I'm going to talk about those now. OK, so to understand this next library, we need to understand something about how embeddings work, and specifically text embeddings. So text embeddings are a way that we can take human readable words and encode them into vectors that a machine, like a computer, can manipulate and understand. OK, so to understand this next library, we have to understand a little bit about embeddings, specifically text embeddings. Now, I'm going to go over this briefly, but if you want to learn more, I highly recommend the video about text embeddings by Robert Miles on the Computer File channel. It's really excellent, and it'll go into much more detail than I can here. So the point of text embeddings is to convert a human-readable word into something that a computer can understand, which is a vector, which is just a list of numbers. So a simple vector could only contain two variables, x and y, and we can plot that on a simple xy plot, but there's no reason we can't have a three-dimensional vector that has x, y, and z, and we could imagine plotting that on a three-dimensional graph, but vectors can be arbitrary numbers of dimensions, and in the case of text embeddings, we can create 10, 20, 30 dimensional spaces, and each dimension can refer to a different attribute of that word to help us group different words together and understand how they're related. So in this case, it's a seven dimensional vector and they've just named each of the uh, variables in the vector, for example, living being, feline, human, etc. And each of these words gets a certain value depending on how it fits into this particular category. It's important to understand that the values for each of these different categories are not being generated by humans they're learned by the machine learning model when we train it on a huge amount of data. And through that, it can understand that kitten and cat both have similarity along some axis. So we can see in this example that cat and kitten both have similar values for this feline dimension. So we know that cat and kitten are close to each other in this dimension of space. But for example, kitten and houses are very far away from each other on this feline dimension. So that's how we can understand some kind of grouping, or at least the computer can group them in this n-dimensional space. In this case, it's seven-dimensional space. And we can do something called principal component analysis, or TISNY, or UMAP, which is basically a type of dimensional reduction. So when we do this dimensionality reduction, what we're doing is choosing the most important components that differentiate a certain set that we're interested in and plot those on a two-dimensional or three-dimensional space rather than their true representation which is seven-dimensional and very hard to visualize. So here we can see cat and kitten are quite close to each other but they're not that close to dog and then houses are way over here. So cat, dog, and kitten are closely related to each other as compared to houses. So that makes sense. And this is actually how all the words are encoded in these large language models. They have a huge multi-dimensional space. We don't know exactly how big in some of these models like GPT-4, but maybe 20, 30 dimensions. And 
by mapping these different words in these n-dimensional vector spaces, it can cluster things like cat and kitten and dog, and then other words like um, king, queen, man, woman, and understand how they're related. So here's an example of a dimensional reduction of a very large number of embeddings. In this case, it's reduced to three dimensions from 200 dimensions. So we can move through this um, embedding vector cloud in 3D space, and we can look at the clusters. So we can see here we have frac, right arrow, cos, pi, inequality. So that's clearly some cluster related to math. And then over here we have shooter, summers, temperate, climate, warm, cool, cold. So clearly this cluster has some relationship related to weather, climate, and temperature. And then we can look over here, we got mountains, rocky, fertile, valley, inland. So this is just a little demonstration of how we can understand the way that these embeddings are working inside these language models. They're really high dimensional spaces, but we can imagine how they're clustered in a lower dimensional space through these visualizations like principal component analysis or TISNI. Okay, so now that we understand a little bit more about text embeddings, we can talk about why we would want them for our AI assistant and how we would implement them. Large language models like GPT-4 are trained on a huge amount of data, so they can answer a wide range of questions, but they can't answer questions about data that they haven't been trained on. Now, you can give them data in the form of a prompt and then ask them questions about it, but you're limited by the number of tokens that you can give as an input, so you can't give very long amounts of text and ask questions about it. So here's one way that we could use text embeddings to get around that limitation. We have something like an ebook here, and we can extract the text. So we get this block of text. This is the first part of Harry Potter. Then we can split the text into these different chunks and save each of those chunks in a CSV file. And we can also take each of those chunks and convert it into an embedding using some kind of embedding encoder. And then we can save those embedding chunks into a different CSV file. Then we can generate a query, so where do Mr. and Mrs. Dursley live? And then we convert that query into a different embedding. And then this is where the magic happens. We use something called cosine similarity, which basically compares the similarity of two different embeddings that were generated with the same embedding encoder, and it finds the one that's most similar to it. So when we compare our query embedding to the embeddings that we generated from our text blocks earlier, we'll see that the most similar embedding is going to be the first one, where we had the text Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive. And then once we find that embedding in our embeds CSV, we can just retrieve the corresponding plain text from our text CSV and pull that out. And then we can just feed this into the large language model to get our answer. Now here it's pretty obvious why the cosine similarity function would find that this, this embedding is most similar because they both have Mr. and Mrs. Dursley in them. But remember, because of the way the embeddings work, they don't actually have to be any of the same words. So it's comparing how they relate to each other in this higher dimensional space. So if um, we were encoding text about kittens and our query had cats, then we would actually have a good match with the cosine similarity because even though those words are totally different, they're quite close to each other in the embedding space and the cosine similarity takes advantage of that. So it's not just a simple text lookup function, it's comparing how close those two embeddings are to each other. So that's one example of how we can use text embeddings to analyze a large amount of text. One other thing that we can do is once we generate all these text embeddings, we can figure out what is the most central of all those text embeddings. So that means what is the most prototypical of those embeddings, and we can get one or several of those that are closest to the middle. And the ones that are closest to the middle are gonna be those that are most representative of that text. And that's useful because the ones that are most representative of the text contain context that's useful for generating a summary. So we could feed it a book that contains a very large amount of text, make the embeddings, and then find the most representative texts 
from the embeddings and use that to generate a summary of a very large block of text. So now I'll show you how that's actually implemented. Okay, so this is the document embedding library. And I'm not going to walk through all these functions because Basically all of them just take one type of file and get the text out of it. So I have one for PDFs, one for Word documents, text files, rich text files, ODT, PowerPoint files, EPUBs, which are eBooks, and Python files, and HTML, and audio, where we use a Whisper to transcribe audio into text. So those are all the helper functions, so we can specify. Here's a directory. It has a bunch of different types of files in it get the text from each one of those types of files. So the split text just takes the text that we can generate from some other um, function and it splits it into a specified chunk size. We uh, go through and make a bunch of different text chunks and add them to this text chunks list and then we just return it. Then this is where we create the embeddings with the create embeddings function. So there's a model from OpenAI called Text Embeddings Ada002. I think they have a couple others, but I believe this is the most up-to-date one. And what we do is we take the text chunks that we generated from the previous function, we create this embedding model, and we feed each of the text chunks into that model and get back those embeddings. That's how we're going to convert those chunks into embeddings. And then we have another function that's called write embeddings to CSV, where we take in some embeddings and we give it a path where we want that file to go to. And we just use um, the CSV library to write to that file. So for each embedding, just keep writing it in there. And that's how we can generate that uh, embedding CSV. But we also need to read it from there later. So pretty similar thing, we're just using the CSV library to look at each line in a, a CSV and return the contents, which we're calling embeddings. Uh, we also have this function write chunks to CSV, very similar to the writing embeddings function. The only difference is we're using a UTF-8 because all these text documents can have all kinds of uh, text characters, so it's just writing the, the text into that CSV file. And similarly, we have a read the text chunks from the CSV using, again, UTF-8. And then these are a couple of the functions for analyzing those embeddings. Calculating the centroid and closest embeddings to the centroid. That's what I was talking about before, where we look to find the ones that are most representative. And then we use those to generate summaries. So um, I'm just using stuff from uh, NumPy to actually do this calculation. I actually didn't take linear algebra, so it was kind of beyond my understanding. But like I said, we're looking for the most representative embeddings in that high dimensional space that's generated by the embeddings engine. And then the search embeddings um, is the function that searches for the most similar embeddings given the query using the cosine similarity, which we talked about before. And this n number is the number of top results to return. So the higher the n number, the more chunks we're going to get back. Um, so we just query, we have our query em embedding, which um, we get from the creation of the embeddings. So this is where we take the question and turn it into an embedding, and then we get the cosine similarity from the embeddings that we've already made with what our query is, and we get the best results and sort them and then we return the indexes of those top results. Because remember, we actually want the indexes in order to retrieve the plain text chunks. We can't really do much with the embeddings themselves. We only need to create the embeddings so we can do stuff like the cosine similarity. And then retrieve answer is where we take those indices that we got, and then we look for those indices in the corresponding text chunks. So this only works when the text chunks and the embeddings are created exactly from the same text chunks um, because we need to make sure that everything lines up. That's what's happening here. We look for the index of the chunks um, based on the indexes that we supplied and we get them back. So that's going to be the text chunks um, that we found. Um, Summarize text does the similar thing where it uses the indexes that we got from the centroid, which is the most representative 
um, area of our high dimensional space and it retrieves those answers. Um, here we're retrieving three, so we would retrieve three text chunks that are closest to the most representative of our sample. This one, process docs and create CSV, takes all those functions that convert different file types into text and makes the text, makes the text chunks, makes the embeddings, writes it all to a CSV, and it just gives you back the path to that CSV and the path to this to the uh, text chunks CSV. So I'm not going to go through all of this. It's pretty straightforward as far as what we're doing. The concept I think is the most important part. Then I have this little one that says check embeds um, because we just always will save the embed file as embeds.csv. So we want a function to see have we already made that file because if we did we don't want to generate another embed file. Um, and then this one checks a folder path. Um, and then we have our summary agent. So the summary agent has the system role of you give a brief summary of a given text. The summary should be concise, informative, and accurately reflect the contents of the given text. Reply only with the summary itself. What we do here is we give it some prompt and it will summarize that text. So later we're going to feed it those chunks that we got from the centroid, the most representative chunks. And then we have the query agent, which does a very similar thing. It answers a user's questions given some text as context to help answer the question. The user request will be in the form of a list. The first item in the list is the user's question. The other elements in the list will contain text relevant to answering the question. Do not contradict the contents of the given text in your answer. Reply only with the answer to the question. So that means when we make a query, we're going to have our question like, where do Mr. and Mrs. Dursley live? And then we're going to give in the rest of the list the context, which is the best thing that we found from the cosine similarity of our query. And we're going to have this model get the answer. So this document agent just um, combines all the helper functions that I've shown above into one big thing. It takes a user's request about documents in a folder where they're talking about some kind of folder name and they're going to ask for either a summary or a query and then you're going to reply with a two item list. So the first item will be summarize if they want a summary or otherwise it's going to be the query that the user is making and then the second item in the list is the path to the folder that they're referring to. That might mean that someone's saying summarize the contents in the Harry Potter folder and we can supply it with a list of folder names and it will be able to say this person's looking for a summary and they're looking for something called Harry Potter so they'll find a folder named Harry Potter. So that's what's happening here. Here we're just converting the uh, reply which is formatted as a list but is actually a string. We're converting it into a real string so the first part of that list will be the query um, which could either be summarize or the query and then the folder which is where does the uh, model think the folder that the user wants is um, and then we create the embedding path and the chunk CSV path by uh, taking the folder that the model thinks we're talking about and appending embeds or chunks.csv depending and then we use all those helper functions we basically see do we have that embeds folder already? Because if not, we need to make process all those documents, we need to make, make that embedding CSV, and then we need to retrieve that. Otherwise, we can just read it from the uh, CSVs that we've already created, right? And then we check the query field, which should be either summarize or some specific query. If the query is summarized because the agent decided that the person was looking for a summary, then we get the um, text from the most representative sample that our summarize text function got and we feed it into our summary agent to turn that most representative text into a summary and then we return it. Otherwise we know that the person's looking for a query and so we take um, we, we find the embedding that's most close to their query we get that answer and then we add their question with the block um, of that that we retrieved and we submit that whole thing 
to the query agent and return that answer. Okay, so now I'll give a demo of the summarize function. So I'll call the doc agent and say summarize the contents of the angel folder and we're going to print the output. And then over here in the docs folder I have angel's brother and there's a book. It's an ebook um, called angel's brother and we're going to have it summarize. So there's no text embeddings or anything. Okay, so let's call the function. And it's going to have to create those embeddings. So it created the chunks and the embeds, and it's running the summary function right now. Okay, so the text revolves around Angel and Gerald, two siblings dealing with the aftermath of an accident involving their friend Dora Mickle, and on and on and on. So that looks like a pretty reasonable summary. And then I can show you what the chunks CSV looks like. It just looks like this. So it's just the whole book broken up into chunks, with each piece being a new row. And then the embeddings file looks like this. Just a whole bunch of numbers. All those vectors. Okay, so now I'm just going to demonstrate the query function using the embeddings. So in this book, Angel's Brother, there's a cricket match, and it says there are many visitors to watch the match on Saturday afternoon, for the weather was beautifully fine. So we can ask our program, Pico, in the book, um, Angel's Brother, what day is the grammar school cricket match? And it doesn't know because it was never trained on that data. Now if we say analyze the folder angels and tell me what day the grammar school cricket match. So analyze and folder are both keywords that will tell it to use the doc agent. And we told it angels and that's uh, the name of the folder. And we've already created the embeddings and the text chunks. So let's see what it does. There you go, Saturday afternoon. Okay, one more library that I wanted to go over is this one that I wrote called Browser Interface, um, which uses natural language to interact with the browser using the Selenium library. Um, it's based on this uh, recently published paper um, called Language Models Can Solve Computer Tasks, and they wrote a model that can um, interact with the browser and HTML pages by like filling out forms, clicking links, um, and that kind of stuff. And they go into a little bit of detail on how they do it. They were using um, GPT 3.5 Turbo, which is chat GPT, so less powerful than GPT 4. And while they don't really give the code, they do give some examples of the types of prompts that are being used and like the output of the model. So I kind of reverse engineered some of it. Um, it doesn't work perfectly. They also use something <clears throat> like a, a recursive prompting strategy, which I've implemented in another um, library called the RCI prompt, which you can check out on the GitHub page, but I didn't actually implement it yet in this browser interface. I'm not very knowledgeable about the Selenium package. I kind of just hacked this one together, but I'll try and go through some of the stuff. Um, so first we'll just go through the helper functions um, in a little bit of detail, but not too much. So we have this initialized driver, so we start up uh, Chrome and get the URL. So we need to start a driver for Selenium to actually work. And then from here we have just a bunch of, um, we're using a bunch of the Selenium uh, methods to manipulate uh, to do things to the driver. So we can type text, can select an input box, or press a key. Um, 
and these are just using the methods provided by the Selenium library, like driver dot find element, and then it takes an X path, uh, takes the target X path. So the X path is um, a way to parse XML files or HTML files, select certain items in them. So there's going to be uh, paths to certain items in an HTML page, similar to the way that a uh, operating system has paths to different files and folders like your C drive slash users slash your username. There's also a similar method that you can use to get the target path of uh, given elements in HTML. And so we're just using these methods to um, define how we could interact with things. Um, so I'm not going to go through them individually, but we can click on an element, we can click on an option, move the mouse, select an input box, navigate to a URL, scroll. These are all things that you need to do in order to navigate a web page effectively. This, this function packages a lot of them together. It's called execute instruction. So it uh, takes some instruction and we use uh, regex, which is regular expressions, to match what's happening. So it could be looking for the word type followed by some string of words that we're typing, or it could be press and then some button that we want to press, so like press enter, press arrow right, press backspace. Um, the regular expression will basically match that so we don't have to input exactly what we want, or rather we can put what we want and this um, regex will recognize things that fit this general format. I'll just say regular expressions are useful but a nightmare. So this is what uh, the RE package is the regular expressions library and that's what's happening here is basically we're saying did someone did we input type something and if so then we'll call um, the type text thing. Did we see um, target key something? If so, then we'll use the press key function. So that's what this whole thing does. And then the execute instructions just uh, takes a list of instructions with um, uh, the arguments um, in a dictionary and it'll iterate through them and execute each instruction as it comes. And I'll show you the format of that. So then we have our browser agent, which is again a GPT-4 agent temperature set to zero and um, the instructions basically say your browser automation program that understands natural language requests and you convert user requests into a list of instructions for this execute instruction function and then we talk about all the uh, functions that it can use and tell it exactly what the output should be your response should be a list of dictionaries where each dictionary contains a function key function name and the arg keys with a list of the function arguments. We can call the browser agent and it'll return it'll return that list, but that list with the dictionaries is going to be a string. So um, but that's okay because in the execute instructions we use uh, eval we use this literal eval so it'll convert the string into the uh, the list with dictionary type directly. So what we do is we call the browser agent with the command please go to the Google website and search for burrito near me. Don't forget any important steps. I actually noticed that including that don't forget any important steps improved the output a little bit and this is um, a not perfect alternative to the recursive prompting. Um, anyway, so then we'll print the instructions just so you can see what the output of the browser agent looks like and then we'll tell um, we'll call execute instructions on those instructions and we'll just wait five seconds because uh, normally it'll close right away. So let's see what happens. All right, so it searched for a burrito near me. It's waiting for the five seconds and then it closes it. It did get some kind of error, but it didn't seem to affect anything. And so this is what the output looks like. You can see it's a list um, because it has these brackets here and then it has four um, items in the list and the items in the list contain these uh, dictionaries, so uh, key value pairs 
function, and then the function which is initialize the driver, that should always be first, and then the arguments, google.com. So it knows to call the uh, initialize driver function, and the argument for that function should be www.google.com, and actually the GPT-4 model just knew the address when I just said go to the Google website. It could figure out that's where we wanted to go. And then it's selecting the input. This is the uh, the text box. It knew to type the phrase burrito near me, and then it knew that it had to press enter. So right now, this thing is pretty um, finicky, but uh, potentially this could allow Pico to interact with the web like a human. All right, thanks for watching.